and I had to ask, what kind of world would we be living in if they had absolute and complete domination over everyone, everywhere? In this new world order of theirs, a tiny number of people would exercise total control over the lives of everyone through a system of intrusive surveillance, violence, suppression of dissent, and debt slavery. Imagine tiny islands of opulence surrounded by a sea of misery, where the mission of the military is to protect the haves from the have-nots. I've come to believe that their end game is truly ominous and that they will stop at nothing to continue implementing their plan. As difficult as it may be for Americans to accept, I'm now convinced the agenda of the global elite includes destroying the financial strength and sovereignty of the United States. With its history of free speech and armed revolt, America represents the major hurdle to global consolidation of power. If they can succeed in bringing down this country, I believe the international elite intend to transfer the power and productivity of Americans to their one world dictatorship, gradually taking over our lives in what David Icke calls the totalitarian tiptoe. Think about it. They've got us so deep in debt we can never repay it. They're collapsing the dollar and they're attempting to replace it with a global IMF currency. This press for a global cashless electronic currency would enable a central authority to financially disable any individual or group in an instant. Now, for the first time in history, international taxes are being proposed under the pretense of addressing climate change. Like a Trojan horse, the suggested treaty unveiled at the 2009 Copenhagen Climate Conference appealed to our concern for the environment while distracting us from the fact that this unprecedented carbon tax would be paid to the World Bank and enforced by global police. There are ways to address our obvious need to curtail pollution without creating a tax base for tyranny. You want to change society in a way that you know that if you do it openly, you know you're going to get an adverse reaction. So you don't do it openly. You play problem, reaction, solution. Stage one, you create a problem. It could be a terrorist bomb, it could be a 9-11, it could be a run on a currency, it could be a stock market collapse, a government collapse. You tell the people your version of A, who did it, and B, why. And at this point, problem, reaction, solution would fall down if we had a media that was in any way related to journalism. Instead, the mainstream media is a public relations office for the official version of events. Turns out President George W. Bush was right about Saddam Hussein hiding weapons of mass destruction. The virtually only um, way or source of information that the public have about this event is from the mainstream media. And what they're looking at stage two of problem, reaction, solution is the reaction of outrage of key, key, key fear and they want the public to say to the government, something must be done, this can't go on, what are you going to do about it? And this allows stage three, which is those who created the problem, glean that public reaction with a false story to then openly offer the solutions to the problems they have themselves created. The idea of using tragedy, manufactured or simply utilized, was deeply significant in my finally understanding how far these people will go to achieve their goals. It's a documented fact that we entered the Vietnam War under false pretenses. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara has acknowledged that the attack on a ship in the Gulf of Tonkin didn't actually take place. Our judgment that we've been attacked that day was wrong. It didn't happen. More recently, former President Bush used non-existent weapons of mass destruction as a pretext for invading Iraq. Tactics like this are sometimes referred to as false flag operations. An increasing number of people believe that 9-11 was a false flag operation by the global elite in order to set the stage for taking over Middle East oil and dismantling U.S. constitutional protections. There are lives in the balance. 
There are people under fire. There are children at the cannon. There is blood on the wire. There is blood on the wire. There is blood on the wire. There is. Most of what's needed for a police state is actually already in place. Right now in America, any of us can be imprisoned without warning or due cause, and we can be kidnapped, tortured, and assassinated legally if the government decides what we are doing is a threat to their plan. All they have to do is name us as a suspect in their so-called war on terror. We're being watched more and more. In 2010, there were 30 million surveillance cameras recording us in the U.S. alone. When we demonstrate, we're now relegated to what are euphemistically called free speech zones. Zones for free speech? Every phone call and email we send is collected and archived and can be inspected at any time. Our driver's licenses and passports have computer chips implanted in them to track our every move. And now hospital patients are getting these same chips implanted under their skin. In fact, it was Procter & Gamble who developed these chips, initially for tracking their products. It's always offered as a way to help, but even an assistant director of central intelligence has admitted it's an entry point to getting all of us chipped for better tracking and control. These would-be controllers through the U.S. Space Command have outlined a plan called Full Spectrum Dominance sophisticated satellite surveillance, as well as directed energy and laser weapons, which are already developed, have the ability to target dissenters anywhere on Earth. I believe they are also trying to ensure they can deal effectively with any resistance. FEMA containment camps and railroad cars with shackles have been recently constructed or refurbished all over the United States for use in what officials call times of pandemic or civil unrest.